Asia was desperate for food after World War II. Only massive shipments of imported grain was averting famine. Demographers and economists widely predicted that population would outstrip food production so much in the developing nations that the 1970s would be a time of famines. In 1960, the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations pooled their resources to start a global agricultural research center, through which scientists from all nations could work as teams to help farmers grow more of the world's most vital crop. The International Rice Research Institute, or IRI, the first of 16 international agricultural research centers today. The headquarters for this bold new initiative would be in Los Baños, Philippines, about 60 kilometers south of Manila. Heading the rice breeding program at IRI would be Dr. Peter Jennings, an enthusiastic young scientist that Rockefeller Foundation had earlier assigned to a rice program in Colombia. And Peter Jennings had been down before he went to South America. He spent um, several months at Beaumont to become, get acquainted with the the rice plant and what the problems were. In 1962, Peter Jennings brought Hank to the Philippines to help develop strategies for eliminating hunger. They agreed that the main constraint to rice yields in Asia was, like in Texas, the tall structure of the rice plant. Peter Jennings shared Hank's enthusiasm for developing a semi-dwarf rice. He led a team that dusted pollen from Dijiao Wu Jin a dwarf rice from China, onto the panicles of peta, a tall, vigorous variety from Indonesia, hoping to initiate the development of a semi-dwarf rice plant. In 1963, Hank Beechel made a move that would change his life and the lives of hundreds of millions of rice farmers and consumers in the developing countries. Hank accepted a position as rice breeder at Erie. Texas farmers didn't want Hank to leave. And I told some of my rice farmer friends that I thought I could help them more by going to Asia and bringing back new information than I could by staying at home. And there was always the dream of the semi-dwarf rice. And uh, uh, that uh, did, was brought about by the fact that we couldn't find a dwarf gene. I hadn't found the gene here and it was absolutely essential in the next step. Leaving Texas was hard for the transplanted Nebraskan. Very difficult because I had so many friends here. My wife was, had many friends in Beaumont and, and to go overseas for the first time while uh, living. Uh, I still remember when we were driving up the barrios on both sides of the road right before we got into Erie. I said, God, am I going to be living here for the next <laughs> 10 years? But it was, uh, that was all forgotten. The rice was important and, and uh, it was a good decision. And then simultaneously, Hank took American varieties back to Asia when he moved to Asia, and they became the foundation of some of the Erie releases. So there was a lot of germplasm movement that went with the Hank Beechel story. But when I got to Asia, the first two years was um, very difficult. Variety names meant nothing. and. Uh, it just concentrating on, because uh, I did quite a bit of traveling those early years to uh, get acquainted in different countries to find out something about the germplasm and what the problems were. By late 1966, Hank Beechel's dream was about to come true. He and his colleagues had selected a semi-dwarf progeny from Erie's eighth cross of the dwarf plant from China with the tall rice from Indonesia. Its strong stems held the plant proudly upright, even when heavily fertilized. And that allowed it to yield bountifully. The new rice was also non-sensitive to day length, so farmers anywhere could grow it at any time of the year. But poor grain quality was a drawback. <laughs> so did you eat IRA when you released it? Yes, I, I was foolish enough to eat it, yes. But I wanted to eat it right after it came out of the pot. I didn't want it to sit around anyway. Sat around a while, but it got uh, hard and re retrograde, and it did scratch your throat. <laughs> but the cooking quality was secondary. Milling quality was secondary. The main thing was, was rice, production. 
but famine loomed in the developing countries. It didn't take long to under realize that the uh, social economic situation uh, was, was critical and uh, as had been uh, uh, predicted in, that there was going to be famine in Asia within the next 20 to 30 years unless we had some drastic changes in methods of producing rice. And uh, so the, the challenge was there to what could we do about it as scientists living there. Feeding people was more important than grain quality. Erie released the revolutionary rice variety to farmers as IR8. The rugged semi-dwarf changed world rice production forever. With good management, the new semi-dwarf rice could yield four, five, even six tons per hectare on fields where farmers had harvested one or two tons for centuries. The immediate decision was we'll spread that seed to everybody we can. And in the Philippines, we, I think it was a, about one kilo of seed <clears throat> was distributed in one program to everybody that, that wanted it. We had a very free distribution. And the minute we found something good, we told the people about it. We distributed it to every country in the, in, in the, all over Asia. But if something that worked, it, it moved very fast. And uh, just overnight, practically, you saw these fields that were planted to uh, the high-yielding varieties. The press soon called the remarkable transformation of Asian agriculture the Green Revolution. But the job wasn't over. Not only did the grain quality of IR8 need improvement, then we had to start searching for sources of insect and disease tolerance. And uh, they were forthcoming, going to South in, in, mostly South India, or in Sri Lanka. That led to newer semi-dwarfs with better grain quality and genetic resistance to withstand pests without environmentally destructive pesticides. The greatest tribute to the work of scientists like Hank Beechel is that the time of famines gave way to bountiful harvests from the new varieties and technologies.